Bonjour amigos, welcome and this is Blitzboy HD. I would like to apologize, but for this video I won't be using too many images. In fact, I don't think I'll be using, using images at all. I'll just be talking. About a year ago, I was about to start a language series that would feature discussions of various languages across the world. For that series, I made another introduction video. The introduction video, I think, was good to a certain extent, but I think it missed the mark on a few occasions. Okay, what was the video meant to do? The series where I talk about languages, there are some keywords that are very important to understand, but it would be quite, um, I guess, irresponsible of me to just assume that anyone coming across the video would just know what I'm talking about. But also, it will be very tedious to have to listen to me repeat over and over again, every video, the same stuff. So instead, I will, I'll say, okay, maybe I should just make one video where I just explain the stuff and anytime someone doesn't understand. Well, at, at the beginning of the video, I'll say, all right, if you don't understand something, here's a video you should be up it. You should be able to understand. But I do think that in the year that has passed, I've learned a bit more. So... In this video, I'm going to give a better, well, hopefully, a better introduction to languages and linguistics. And don't worry, I'm going to assume that you haven't seen the previous video. Firstly, let's start off with what a language is. When we talk about language, what exactly are we trying to say? What we're saying, well, language, we're talking about a human language, which is a set of signals mostly vocal signals that you use to communicate ideas and i'll stop there for now because otherwise you know that we could be talking for a while now we do have to ask ourselves a couple of questions why why do we have languages exactly well like man, most of the things we have languages came out of a need to to survive it helped us better communicate ideas instead of taking all the time to draw or play charades we could simply just say what we wanted to, what we wanted to um, communicate. And when we use a language, we don't go over every single word in the language. We just use a set of words um, and we use them to string together a sentence with one particular idea. In the same way that when we're using a, when we're doing a drawing, we don't draw everything. We just use a couple of lines and we make a drawing. And uh, no matter how complicated the drawing is, it, there's always going to be two basic parts. A straight line and a curved line. And languages, even though they seem very complicated, they can be split into... Uh, they are made up of two types of words. Name related and action related. And we'll get more into this when we discuss the grammar section. But now we have to discuss uh, the varieties of a language. People speak different languages all across the globe. But that doesn't mean that people use one language the same way. If two different people speak the same language, they will use it very differently when it comes to uh, what certain words mean, when to use certain words, etc. etc. A lot of the times these differences also have overlap in certain communities. Uh, for example, Scottish English and Australian English is spoken by the Scottish and Australian communities. And these communal varieties, they're called dialects. Now, usually, though not always, but historically speaking, dialects tend to be... Uh, they tend to be more similar the closer they are. Uh, this is what we call a dialect chain. A dialect chain doesn't just refer to different dialects, but also, I guess, different languages. Um, for example, in North India, we have a bunch of languages descended from the Saraseni Prakrit, or Saraseni, I forget which one. Um, I speak a little bit of Hindi, but even though I speak a little bit of Hindi, I can understand most of the other languages. I can understand Gujarati, Punjabi, um, I can understand Bhojpuri, and so on. And when I was younger, I would watch Bollywood movies. I wouldn't even recognize that they were different languages. So that's how similar they are. But they are considered different languages for reasons we'll get into in a bit. Now, that's not dialects aren't the only variety of 
language uh, that a language has there is also what is called a diachronic variety that is variety through the ages now when exactly do we consider these varieties as different languages we really have no idea <laughs> Uh, it depends on the speakers. What do they consider the language's identity to be? There are some cases where language, where one language will have dialects that are very different from one another, but are still considered, but it's still considered as one language. And then there are other occasions where you have many different languages which sound, which sound like the same language, but because the speakers consider themselves to be speaking a language of a different identity they are considered different languages there's also um, there's also another an interesting case of assyrian assyrian refers to two different languages because the the people the assyrian people used to speak a dialect of akkadian which is known as assyrian but they also speak a modern form of aramaic called well assyrian and the thing is even though they're different languages they are related, but they are different languages, which we all do agree with. They are still known by the same name because of the speakers. There's also another uh, instance with, <clears throat> I think it's Swedish and Norwegian, where some dialects, because of the dialect chain, some dialects are closer, especially by the border, or some are closer to the other language closer to dialects of the other language than they are to dialects of their own but they're still considered uh, the lang their respective languages as far as diachronic languages are concerned when can we say that a language has changed enough to be considered separate languages that again depends on the identity for instance Greeks today consider themselves the same culture as the Greeks of antiquity as the Greeks of the uh, the Bronze Age, which is why Greek is considered one language, the diachronic varieties, but it's still considered one language. That is not the case with Italian and Latin, because nowadays Italians don't consider themselves Romans. So even though we have a situation where... So now we have a situation where one language is the same over a certain period of time, but another is not. And speaking of Greek and Latin, let's talk about some special languages. Now let me just clarify, every language is special, and uh, that, that will be a recurring theme in my series. But in some societies, some languages have a more important role, uh, but also in world history in general, some languages have been more influential. Uh, let, me, let me talk about them quickly. Firstly, a standard language. A standard language is basically a... Uh, how do you say it? In languages that have a lot of variety, a standard language is basically the form that represents the language, and it's usually based on a very important dialect. For instance, standard French is based on Parisian, uh, standard Bangla on Rorhi dialect, standard Russian on the Moscow dialect, and there are some instances where, where a uh, text can also standardize a language, like, the, uh, like Martin Luther's Bible translation. And I think the Arabic of the Quran, for a while, it standardized the language. And I think there are a couple of more instances. And lastly, I also want to discuss another aspect. When a standard and colloquial language are very different, or if a community speaks two different forms of the same language, we say that it is diglossic. For instance, in Greek, there was a time when the written language, which was based more on ancient Greek, as opposed to the, uh, vo the vernacular dialect, which was... Uh, I guess changing as Greek does, as languages do. Uh, I think demotic and katarevusa, as they were called, that would be an example of diglossia. And secondly, let's discuss lingua francas. Lingua francas are not to be confused with a standard language. A lingua franca, or a bridge language, is a language chosen so that different communities have an easier time communicating with each other. Uh, it may also be the language that political documents and ceremonies take part in. For instance, Latin was the standard language for Europe for a long time. Sanskrit in India, as, uh, as hopefully it will be once again. And speaking of Latin and um, 
And speaking of Latin and Sanskrit, let's discuss the third category, classical languages. There, are, there isn't a set standard for what when a language can be considered a classical language, but there's usually uh, one category is that it has to be very influential and there and it usually has some sort of literary history. And uh, lastly, there's also one another, other thing I wanted to discuss. There are sometimes, sorry, the dog is barking. There are sometimes when a language has multiple forms throughout time and one of those forms will be considered a classical language. Now there's another there's another type of language that gets confused with classical languages but they're not the same and that is liturgical languages or sacred or holy languages whichever name you want. They are languages that are used for religious purposes, ceremonies and so on. Due to the fact that religion has had such a big impact on human history a lot of liturgical languages tend to be classical languages, but it's not a hundred percent. And yes, let me just clarify, there are some languages that have many different forms, and some of those forms are considered liturgical, but also different forms of the languages, different forms of the language can be considered liturgical by different people, by different religions or different sects of a religion, and so on. Now, now let's talk about the different parts of a language. A language can be divided into three different parts, vocabul vocabulary, grammar, and orthography. Let's discuss what these are and then we'll look at them individually. Firstly, vocabulary. In a language, the vocabulary is the collection of words that the language has and what exactly those words mean. The vocabulary is linked to grammar and to writing, but Depending on the language, it is possible to know a lot of words without knowing exactly how to use them in a sentence, grammar, and so on. In fact, vocabulary, vocabulary is typically the first thing you learn in a, a language. Second, let's talk about grammar. Grammar, specifically in a language, is the, it's the set of rules that the language, have, that the language has. <laughs> Very ironic. <laughs> And typically, we look at the grammar of a language in different layers. The first layer is phonology, then morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, and we'll discuss those in the grammar section. Thirdly, orthography. Orthography refers to writing. And right now, it is more important than ever, but uh, there are languages where, well, most languages, well, every language, I think, you can speak it and understand it without knowing how to write it. Remember, writing in history, writing is very recent. Languages have been estimated to be around for maybe 150 to 350,000 years, while writing is just over 5,000 years old. Let's discuss the first one, vocabulary. Like I mentioned, this is usually the first thing you'll learn in a language, like how to say mom, how to say dad, how to how to say food or eat, etc. Before you can put together a sentence, you need to know what the what the sen what the words are. The vocabulary of one particular language can be dissected into two groups. Either they come from within the language, which is usually referred to as native vocabulary or they are taken from another language, uh, loan words. Uh, they can be broken down further. Uh, some languages have specific terms for words that come from this language or from that language and so on. A lot of loan words you'll find tend to come from classical languages, but typically it follows the, the grammar of the language that it enters, with some exceptions, of course. Uh, they may come from a language that already has a word to describe something that the particular language does not, such as in English we have used the word coffee, which comes from the Arabic, uh, forgive me for my pronunciation, qawa, I think. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, we, they already had a word, so the English decided to use that word. Again, that's the simplistic explanation. It's actually a little more detailed than that. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit further in the grammar section. Uh, speaking of grammar, let's go there right now.
Remember the five elements that I mentioned before? Uh, like phonology, morphology, and so on. Well, there's actually one that we have to discuss before that, and that is phonetics. The reason why I didn't mention it is because phonetics isn't language specific. It's the study of phones in general. Now phones, they can refer to the thing I'm recording this on, but it's not. that's not what we mean when we talk about phones in languages. In linguistics, a phone is the, small insect, the smallest segment of speech in general. Uh, they're typically letters, I guess, in English you would call them. But the thing is, a let, it's only a letter once it's written down. I know it's, this is very nitpicky, but uh, if I were to say the letter A, unless I write it down, I'm not actually, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not right. Because what I should be saying is the phone A. I know it's very nitpicky, but still. Phonetics, when we classify phones, we can classify them in two different ways. Uh, we can look at how they're produced and where they are produced in the mouth. But we'll discuss more on that in the orthography section, and there's a reason I'm leaving it until then. Now let's discuss those uh, five things that we mentioned before, starting with phonology. The phonology of a language refers to the sounds that are present in it and the way they interact with each other. And we have to keep in mind that the same sounds may work differently in different languages. But also, uh, it's not just the sounds, we also talk about uh, other aspects like pronunciation, stress, pitch, tone, rhythm, and so on. And also we have to discuss what exactly a phoneme is. A phoneme, a phoneme is a language specific way of dissecting sounds. To showcase this, let me take an example. The sounds p, p, and f in English and Bangla. In English, the, let, the sounds p, and p are the same. Well, they're not the same, but they can be used in the same ways. Uh, for instance, in the, some accents, instead of saying part, they would say part. Wait, I, I don't because I have a South African accent. We don't use aspirates. But you can't replace that with f. Right? Fart is a completely different sound. <laughs> it's a completely different word altogether. But, they are, but in my native language, Bangla, it doesn't work that way. In Bangla, P and P is used on its own, while P and F can be used together. For instance, um, there's this, there's a word that we have called uh, fall. Uh, it's uh, the word for fruit, right? Fall and Paul are the same, right? You you can say whichever one, but you cannot say Paul. P is a different sound from P and F in Bangla, but in English. P and P are different, while F is on its own. You see how the same three sounds work differently in the two different languages? Well, this is something you'll come across a lot if you're learning other languages. Second, let's discuss morphology. The morphology is about creating words from different components, which are called morphemes. Remember what I talked about name and action-related words? The most basic name-related and action-related words are nouns and verbs. A noun is the name of a thing doing or receiving an action, or, I mean, usually something along those lines. A verb is an action. These are the two most important ones. After this, languages can be very different. And when I talk about uh, the grammar that I'm about to do now, let me just clarify, I'm, use, I'm talking about the languages that I've investigated on my own. There are languages that work very differently. Nouns. A noun on its own can't really describe an object too well. So sometimes you'll use adjectives. You can replace them using pronouns if it's tedious to repeat it all the time. And also they can show location when you put an at position next to them either preposition before the noun or postposition after the noun and now let's take a, a simple sentence right i looked at the man in that sentence i and man are doing are doing do two different things what if i switch them around and i said the man was looking at me do you notice how 
I and me, or they look different depending on what role they're doing. Now English doesn't really have the feature where it happens to nouns, but in most languages these nouns do. Where nouns are changed depending on their context within a sentence. For instance, in Sanskrit there are eight of these changes called um, called cases. Cases aren't the only ways of changing a, a noun. They can also be modified depending on number, how many they are, and gender. Uh, uh, these are called declensions. Right? Changing a noun to suit a particular category or context is called declension. The cases in Sanskrit are nominative, accusative, instrumental, dative, ablative, genitive, locative, vocative, and so on. If you want, you can investigate them on your own, but don't worry. In my videos, when I go over cases, I will say what the cases are for. But if you do know them, it's better. Greek, <coughs> Greek has less cases, but that doesn't mean that you can't do the same. Uh, for instance, in Greek, it's nominative, accusative, dative, genitive, and vocative. But the extra roles that Sanskrit cases do, they are performed in Greek, just a little differently. For instance, Sanskrit has two different cases for dative, uh, for dative, instrumental, and locative. Well, three actually, but in Greek, because uh, because instrumental and locative are missing, their responsibility goes to the dative case. Uh, in Sanskrit, there's also the ablative, and because in Greek there is no ablative, the the responsibility of the ablative goes to the genitive, and so on. So just because a language has fewer cases doesn't mean it can't show the same meaning. It's just that the extra responsibilities goes to the other cases. Okay, now that we've done nouns, verbs can also do the same thing. Verbs are usually modified, but they can also show more context on their own. Uh, changing a verb to fit these roles is what you would call conjugations. So for nouns, it's declensions. For verbs, it's conjugations. Conjugations can reflect person, as in who is most important in the verb, number, how many of these there are, mood, which is uh, more about the context, voice, which refers to whether the subject, what exactly, what role the subject is doing, and tense, which is the time context, not just the time. Uh, tense is usually a mixture of time and aspect. Uh, for instance, uh, the three main times are past, present, and future, and the, th and the two main aspects are continuous or perfect, but there are also others depending on the language. It's worth noting that some of these forms are more common than others, and by far the active mood and indicative Sorry, the active voice and indicative mood is by far the most common. And if you mix that in with the present tense, so you have active, indicative, present, this is what we mean when we talk about a default sentence. And uh, combining the two aspects that we discussed, combining the two uh, things that we discussed, phonology and morphology, there's a combination of the two called morphonology which studies the changes of the sound in word creation. And thirdly, let's discuss syntax. Syntax is the not the tax you pay when you go to the church. It's also not to be confused with the tax on undesirable products. When we talk about syntax, we're talking about the, or the default word order of a sentence. Remember, because of declensions and conjugations, Word order can be very flexible in most other languages other than, say, English or Afrikaans. But every one of these languages typically has some sort of default. Right? For the active indicative present tense, what is the default order that the languages, that the, that the parts of speech would be in? The majority of languages have a subject at the beginning of the sentence. But they can be split like half and half, depending on whether the verb comes before the object or the object comes before the verb. Uh, we use the terms SVO, subject, verb, object, and SOV, subject, object, verb. Uh, 
Now, these are not the only things when it comes to syntax. We also look at something else. Like we mentioned with add positions, they could be prepositions, whether they come before the noun, post positions, whether they come after the noun. And uh, there's also a couple of other aspects like uh, adjectives, right? Does the adjective come before the noun that is describing or often the noun? Does the does the possessor come before the possessi or afterwards? And so on. Now, many languages tend to fit into what is called a head initial and a head final. A head initial language, let me just put this out quick. A head initial language is a language where the head, or the most important part, comes first. So like the verb, then the object, the noun, then the adjective, the preposition, then the noun, and, and the possessee, so what is possessed, and then the possessor. A head final language, like Bengali for, or Bangla, for instance, has the verb after the object, the noun after the adjective, the postposition after the noun, the possessi after the possessor. But not all languages will fit into these two, but this, these are very common. Lastly, let's discuss two different things, semantics and pragmatics. Semantics is... Do you remember at the beginning when I tried to really define what language is, but I didn't go too far? Well, if you want to be tedious and you want to really look at what we mean when we say a particular word, that is what you would call semantics. Keep in mind that words can mean different things depending on the context you use them, but also depending on who is using them. For instance, when a biologist says stomach, they mean something very different from what a uh, from what we colloquially say colloquially say as stomach now, likewise when socialists talk about private property they're talking about something very different than when economists say private property when physic physicists talk about work they're talking about a work that is very different than what we mean when we say work outside of physics and really there's uh, so many examples i can't list them all Semantics isn't to be confused with etymology. Etymology is finding the origin of these words, not the meaning technically. And uh, usually you can do both. Uh, when you go, go for a definition, a lot of the time it will tell you the meaning, so semantics, but then they will, it will also tell you where it came from. So in that case, it will show your etymology. Pragmatics. Pragmatics is, pragmatics is looking at what exactly a phrase means not literally uh, this is where f your figures of speech usually come into come into play uh, your poetic devices allegories metaphors and so on and this is and pragmatics is also why languages are so difficult to translate because you can always translate words but you can never truly translate meaning right? you cannot translate what it means on paper but you cannot translate what it means to the speaker that for that you really just have to learn the language okay that's the grammar aspect done there's a lot more concerning grammar this is just to prepare you if you're going headfirst into one of my videos lastly let's discuss orthography the third part of our language when we talk about orthography we're talking about how the language is written <coughs> now before we get to orthography let's just mention if two different scripts are related, or if they're not related, that has nothing to do with the language itself. The, it can show you history, but it cannot show you the relations of the languages themselves. For instance, uh, Bangla and Hindi are related, and they are written using related scripts. But if I just make up a, if I just make up a script for writing Bangla, does that all of a sudden make Bangla unrelated to Hindi or the Bangla that I'm using that I'm recording in that script? No, it's still related to Hindi, even though my script isn't. And let's also clarify uh, languages that are written in the same script, for instance, um, Latin and Osa and Vietnamese, they are not related by any means, <laughs> even though they're written in the same script. So that's the thing, scripts can be very deceiving, right? <laughs> but 
enough about the uh, I guess warnings let's discuss scripts in a little further detail there are typically five types of scripts that you can get in the world uh, logographies which is where a particular word or morpheme is represented by a picture uh, or a logogram if you prefer. most of the original writing systems that we that we came up with were logographies uh, hieroglyphs cuneiform the Minoan script uh, uh, sorry linear a I think is what it's called and uh, the Indus Valley script they are all examples of logographies abjads abjads were next with the proto sinaitic abjad the Phoenician abjad Aramaic abjad and so on these are character these are uh, scripts where the majority of characters re typically just represent consonants and when you would write a ver a write a word you would write the consonants and the vowels would have maybe a little uh, diacritic and sometimes they're not even mentioned at all this is mostly used by semitic languages and the, but it's also used by uh, by some other languages like urdu for instance even though it's not a semitic language uh, persian is also not a semitic language and it uses abjads a syllabary a syllabary is a it's a very rare it's a script that has a character representing a consonant and vowel a as opposed to a consonant on its own or a vowel on its own or a word on its own it's one syllable as hence the name syllabary the only one i know of this is uh, hiragana and katakana the japanese scripts but there's also a third one used to write japanese uh, there's also alphabet. Alphabet is the most famous one, but it's actually in the minority. In an alphabet, typically has representation for both vowel sounds and consonant sounds separately. And t and when you write out a word, you would typically write them out next to each other. Abugidas are uh, abugidas are uh, sometimes referred to as alpha syllabaries. We'll, we'll get to why that is. Ha al alphabet. Abugidas have symbols for both vowels and for consonants, but when you would write a word, you would normally write it with a consonant and then you would add a symbol that represents the vowels. Unle uh, unless it starts with a vowel, then you would write it down. Uh, the Devanagari is a good example and uh, the Bangla, Bornamala, uh, the Tamil script, there's uh, quite a lot. And typically, they all descend from the Brahmi script, which may or may not descend from the Aramaic abjad. Uh, we know that the Greek alphabet, the I guess the grandfather of many alphabets, the, descended from the Phoenician uh, abjad. Now, Abugidas, because of their equal representation for vowels and consonants, and because they are typically written as though one symbol with a consonant and vowel, Pe represents a syllable, they can sometimes be called alpha syllabaries, but they don't really fit either of those categories. Now, let's discuss some fine. As we mentioned with Japanese, Japanese was written with three different scripts, even though it's one language. So that's one thing to remember is that one language can be written with different scripts. One script can write different languages. They are not related. So it's very important to not confuse those two. Also, fun fact, um, you know when you when you convert a language, it's called translation. Well, when you convert the script without changing the sounds, that's what you would call transliteration. <laughs> fun fact. And also, if you're wondering, remember what I discussed in the phonetics section about the uh, about how we can classify phones? Well, because so many different languages have different ideas of how to represent sounds we had to come up with a standard a i guess metric system of phonology if you want to call it so we created the international phonetic alphabet so if you want you can research that on your own time but it is going to be quite important to but it is going to be very important when it comes to uh, getting the idea of how words in other languages are pronounced how they sound and so on but also it can help you see 
uh, it can also help you see the relation between different languages because when you represent them in a way that is objective, uh, more objective, then it can really help you understand how much closer the languages are or how far, far away they are. Uh, that covers the parts of a language. Now let's discuss a final aspect of a language and that is its history. How can we determine when languages are related? Those of you familiar with biology, you may know that there was a time when we thought every species on earth wasn't related, that, but that they were just placed there uh, randomly. Well, now we know that's not the case. We found out that there's something called the process of evolution and that animal species are related to each other. And the same thing goes for languages, although it's different than the way it works in biology. Languages evolve over time. But how can we tell when they are related? The default position when we discuss any two languages is that they aren't related but unless it gets to a point where it's more likely that they shared an ancestor than they didn't share an ancestor. Then we can say that they are related. So what is the standard? Right? How, what similarities are we looking for? All right, so as we've discussed, languages can borrow from another. They can they can also be coincidences where the word for mom could be the same. But when we discuss, when we look at what language or languages are related, we look for multiple words that mean the same thing that have a common sound correspondence. Uh, typically, we will look for an array of words that have the same meaning or similar meanings. And if they are related enough, if there are enough words that have sound correspondences, we can say that they came from a common ancestor. And these words are what we would call uh, language, or what we would call cognates. Also, it's very good to examine the grammar, because grammar, it's very rare for a uh, for a language to borrow grammar from another from another language and grammar changes are a lot slower than than any sound shifts so it's always good to examine that and also uh, like uh, another thing I should mention when we look for sound correspondences like I mentioned we would usually take the most commonly used words like food family members numbers and so on and also, we would want to discuss. We would want to see the oldest form of a language because they would have less time to change, and therefore it would be similar to the more similar to the ancestors, to the ancestor. Just like uh, just like real families, language families also have members that are more related to each other than the others. When they share a more recent common ancestor, we can say that they are part of a branch of a family. For instance, the most famous language family, the Indo-European family, has many branches which share more recent ancestors and overall they share uh, an older ancestor. And this also brings together a question, how do languages evolve? How did one language evolve to so many different languages? Well, remember my introduction video that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm going to use the same example now that I that I used back then. <laughs> Suppose we have a place called Samudra side, the Samudra city and peninsula. There's one language spoken there. There's one thing that we have to discuss. That language is always, always, always changing. Every generation, every life, that language changes. In different parts, in different communities, it will change differently, either through vocabulary as I mentioned, the vocabulary may change. They would maybe get a loan word. Maybe a word stays the same but means a different word. Maybe they'll create a new word. Uh, grammar grammar changes, uh, are, uh, like I mentioned, are rare. But they will happen. And they will happen differently in the different areas. And like I mentioned, sound shifts. So these are the main forces that change a different language, that change a language. And this language will change, like I mentioned, it will change differently in one community, it will change differently in another community, and eventually it will get to a point where they become different dialects, forming the aforementioned dialect chain. Where speakers are closer together, they'll understand each other more. Where they're further away, they'll become 
uh, they'll become the more difficult to understand. And given enough time, they will change and change and change and change until eventually they become different languages. And well, how do we language? How do we uh, name language families? Typically, a language family will be named after the geographical area. So if we so if we take these languages spoken by the Samudra Sidian Peninsula, we could just call them the Samudra Sidian languages. And the proto language that we discussed, the language from which they all descended at that time, they were one language. It's usually just named proto, and then the family name. So in this case, it will be proto Samudra Sidian. <clears throat> and when we reconstruct a language, an ancestor. Uh, as I mentioned, always look at the oldest, oldest forms of a language that you can find, unless uh, you know there aren't enough, uh, there aren't there's, there isn't enough writing available. Then we will have to find the uh, slightly younger one if there is more writing. For instance, when it comes to reconstructing Proto-Indo-European, we had to use Ancient Greek instead of Mycenaean Greek because Mycenaean Greek is very difficult to. Uh, uh, it's difficult to put together because the writing system was so ambiguous. Now finally, let's discuss the series. The series itself will have different season. Season 1 is more of a test. Right? I'll be going over different languages. I won't be going over it seriously. I'll just be getting I'll just be using it as a way to discover, you know, what style, what style I like. What's my presenting style? And during the season, I'll be discussing several different languages from several different families, but from season two onwards, there will usually be a particular theme, such as I'm thinking of season two, making season two the uh, languages of India, and then maybe the languages of Europe, languages of the Middle East, dead languages, or whatever. It is possible for me to discuss one language more than, more than once. And that's it. Oh my, this was a long video. <laughs> right, that's it from this video. I hope you tune into the series and I hope, to, I hope that we can have a lot of fun discussing languages together.